Good evening. Welcome to what I hope is going to be an interesting, informative, and maybe even fun evening talking about the effects of alcohol on the fetus during pregnancy. I'm here tonight with my co-trainer, uh, Julie Gilo, who will introduce herself in a moment. My name is Carolyn Hartness. I've been working in the field of FAS for about 10 years. I started working with United Indians of All Tribes Foundation and first learned about FAS in that job, then moved on to work with King County Health Department until this last year uh, doing FAS in the uh, county as well as really traveling quite a bit around the state and the country. I'm also, I've also been part of the FAS Diagnostic Clinic for about 10 years now. So I have a long history with FAS. I find it a passion of mine. Um, I love working with the population and have learned a lot and I'm very happy to be here with you tonight and I'm really thanking you all for coming out tonight to hear about such an interesting and important topic. So I'd like at this time to present my co-trainer Julie Gilo. Thanks, Carolyn. Hi, my name is Julie Gilo, and I'm here tonight because of many different hats, actually. My husband, Lynn, and I have been licensed foster parents in the state of Washington for about 10 years now. And over those 10 years, we've fostered about 18 children, which is not a tremendous number by any means within our state system. Um, but of those 18 children, currently seven of those children are permanently placed in our home, and they range in age from 2 to 17 at this point in time. All of those children have diagnoses of fetal alcohol syndrome and or related conditions. Um, I'm actually the legal mother to 13 children, um, in addition to the seven children that are permanently placed in our home via either adoption or guardianship. I'm also the birth mom of three daughters who are 29, 26, and 23, and I have three stepchildren who are 35, 34, and 31, and almost seven grandchildren. We have six with another one on the way, so we have a large family. I'm also the family advocate at the University of Washington in the Fetal Alcohol Syndrome Diagnostic and Prevention Network at the clinic there at the um, Center on Human Development and Disabilities with Dr. Sterling Claren and Dr. Susan Astley, both of our co-directors. And I am a member of the um, State of Washington Foster Parent Training Institute, and I'm a co-trainer for Region 3, which is Snohomish County and North. And I'm here because my children have been great gifts to my husband and I and have been wonderful teachers and have um, given me also a very deep passion um, to continue to educate myself and others and to continue to advocate for this population. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> I named Julie the crazy angel a long time ago, and I'm excited to know you out there and hope that you're going to call in because I know I have more crazy angels out there. And uh, do feel free to do that. Interrupt us at any point during our talking and ask questions. We'd like feedback. If you recognize behaviors and you've actually come up with interventions at work, please share those with us. And our 800 number is one 800 4079487. And Julie has a bit of housekeeping first. I do, thank you. Um, I'll take care of just this housekeeping, um, the housekeeping business actually, quickly. Um, I need to have all facilitators from the um, satellite sites call in in this order to report your roster attendance. So if you would take this down, you can call in on the 1 800 number that's on your screen. If I could get Aberdeen and Hoquiam. Anacortes and Bremerton to call in at 615, please. Chehalis, Clarkston, and Cusick, Kalispell Tribe at 630. Forks, Goldendale, and Kelso at 645. Long Beach, Linwood Edmonds, and the Neshpelum Colville Tribes at 7 p.m. Newport, Olympia, and OMAC at 715, Pasco, Port Angeles, Port Hadlock at 730, Port Orchard, Puyallup, and Tacoma at 745, Walla Walla, Welpinit, Spokane Tribe, and Yakima at 8 p.m. So if you could call in at those times with your um, roster attendance, we'd appreciate that very much um, at the number of 1-800-407-9487. And then for all of you who have been um, able to log on to your computer um, via web scan tonight and are watching us via your, your computer, if you could email us at some time um, during the evening tonight and also just let us know that you are um, watching, we'll make sure that you get credit for 
um, for being with us tonight. Great. Thank you, Julie. The uh, way this will flow tonight is that we will be speaking for probably about an hour at a time and then having a break, 45 minutes to an hour. We do encourage you, as I said, to call in while we are speaking, and we're also going to give you maybe a little homework during the breaks. And we will have possibly some video towards the end of the program, and we're going to be talking and using slides as we go along. And I'd like to see that first slide, please. A fetal alcohol syndrome is not something that's unique to any particular race, class, or anything else. Alcohol really doesn't care, you know, if you drive the Lexus to work or take the bus. It doesn't care what color you are, uh, who your ancestors were. Wherever the grape was squashed, there was a potential to cause damage to a fetus. And Dr. Claren, Sterling Claren, who's the head of the clinic at the Diagnostic Center, talks about the fact that just three ounces of alcohol during the pregnancy in one week can possibly cause some damage to a fetus. Uh, next slide, please. How do you get fetal alcohol syndrome? Well, as the picture shows here, whatever mom drinks, the uh, fetus drinks. And next slide will show you that the fetus is not really very protected in the womb. The uh, blood supply, of course, brings alcohol directly to the fetus, but also the placenta is really sort of like cheesecloth. The alcohol can come through the placenta easily. As a matter of fact, the health department did an interesting study last year, and they had non-smoking pregnant women exposed to other people's cigarette smoke and found that 85% of their children were growth deficient. Now, there are many things that can affect the fetus during pregnancy, and we have this little bottle here that's filled with cigarettes and pills and all kinds of things, and certainly they all do impact the fetus, but alcohol acts, acts absolutely has more uh, damage, to, uh, offers more damage to the fetus than anything else that we know of. Now there's um, a couple of actual biological reasons for, for this and one of them is that you know as the baby systems are developing um, during the gestational stages, one of the systems that actually is developing but is also functioning during that um, during the pregnancy is the urinary tract system. And so when a developing baby takes in alcohol via the umbilical cord into their um, bloodstream, um, that baby's liver is not metabolizing the alcohol, but it will um, excrete it via the urine and the amniotic waters that that baby is being cushioned in and bathed in during the pregnancy, actually the amniotic amniotic waters is made up of a baby's urine. And during a particular stage of their development, the babies have to actually swallow that amniotic water because that's what will cause their lungs to expand and to develop. So it's we often think of these babies as ingesting alcohol, excreting alcohol, and re-ingesting alcohol. And we hear from delivery room nurses that oftentimes the deliveries of these babies, the room smells like a bar room after the babies have been born. And you know, also it's very important to know that there is no safe amount of alcohol to drink during pregnancy and there's no safe time. Things are happening immediately. The central nervous system starts developing within the first few weeks and probably by the end of the first trimester you really have most of the major organs and everything developed. If you look at the next slide, you'll see that even though the, the baby at delivery has a liver, it is not functioning and uh, until birth, of course. So if you look at this chart, you'll see the red line is mom having had one ounce of alcohol. Her blood alcohol level goes up to about half the legal level in the state of Washington. After a half an hour, it starts coming back down about halfway, and it's met by the fetus's blood alcohol level, which is the blue line, and it actually stays higher than mom's for the next three or four hours. So the fetus is really unable to detox its body as mom is. Even a late-stage alcoholic's liver is trying to detox uh, uh, the alcohol from her system. Next slide, please. And you'll see also that even after birth, we have to worry about alcohol coming into our children through breastfeeding. Now, many women who have managed to stay sober during a pregnancy who have problems with alcohol will say, well, I've stayed sober for the nine months and I'm going to drink now regardless of the fact that I'm breastfeeding. What I say is at least pump the breast milk and feed the uh, breast milk that, that's been pumped when the woman is not drinking to the child during that time because this is also another way for alcohol to come directly into the body and affect that growing fetus. And it still is, you know, we still hear the physicians and the um, 
nursery nurses and all of that who still say if you're having problems bringing you know in your breast milk you need to increase your breast milk to have a beer in the evening to have some beer and I don't know that you know it, it's still an issue that people are not understanding that the alcohol content in breast milk is the same as the alcohol content in the mother's blood so that's being passed directly into the baby yeah again you know, there, if you think about the fact that the fetus is growing in the womb, of course, for nine months, and then the child is growing continuously after birth and, and gets to about 20 before the last of the organs really are developed, the brain, for instance, in boys and girls, and the uh, uterus in girls, there really isn't a good time for alcohol exposure for our children, whether it's in utero or out. There really is a real reason why our children are not to drink until they're 21. Their right. bodies are not really uh, ready to handle alcohol. Uh, in my chemical dependency classes, I remember learning that a 15-year-old who begins to drink alcoholically can become a late-stage alcoholic within six months. That's someone who's dying from alcoholism. An adult who doesn't begin to drink until, say, their 20s and begins to drink alcoholically can take up to 20 years to become a late-stage alcoholic. So we really want to keep our children alcohol-free. And what Julie said about the uh, hospitals and physicians talking to women about using alcohol to help with stress, bring down uh, breast milk, that th sort of thing, is very disturbing to me. And certainly we have many physicians out there who are not telling women to drink during pregnancy. But in the 10 years I've been lecturing, at least once a month, someone will tell me about a current situation, having themselves gone to the doctor or a friend gone pregnant and been told by the physician to go ahead and have some alcohol to relieve stress. Mm -hmm. Certainly, I can think of some other ways to do that. Yes. Some of that nice yeah. music we heard before we went on camera, uh, meditation, go for a walk, something. But we really do not want our children exposed to alcohol in utero or out. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Now, what the question, the burning question in the audience, if there are any men out there, is probably, well, what does dad have to do with this? Uh, actually, uh, even though the, my next slide is a cartoon, it is based on real research that shows, and I'm not sure you can read it, but on the car it says uterus or bust, that's the sperm, asking the beer want to lift. We, we have shown in research that alcohol does damage sperm in human beings, that the, that the sperm is uh, not whole or is damaged in some way. What we don't know, however, is what happens to that sperm. Does that sperm make it to the egg? If it does, does okay. it fertilize the egg? And if it does fertilize the egg, what is the quality of that fertilization? Um, we we go have ahead. a couple of email questions, I understand. Oh, okay. Um, Oh, very good question. Excellent question. Okay, um, go ahead, Julie. At what age can you start to see symptoms of fetal alcohol syndrome and or effects? Um, you can just talk about your children. I can talk about my children. <laughs> One at a time. Um, it can vary with every child. If, if a child has the full-blown fetal alcohol syndrome, occasionally, you know, oftentimes we may see the facial features, we may see the growth deficiency at birth or, you know, in infancy. But it can be very difficult for us to determine, and we're going to talk a lot about this next kind of subject, but it's very difficult for us to determine to what extent and in what areas the brain may have been affected. And especially in infants, you know, we're, there really aren't any sophisticated enough tests out there to determine, especially if the brain damage is subtle. Um, in, at the clinic, we often say that the ages for the best, you know, age for diagnosis would be about five to ten. But that's not a hard and fast rule. I mean, we have diagnosed um, infants as young as three and a half months, and we've diagnosed um, adults as old as 55 at the clinic. So it varies with every population. A lot of times, though, the subtleness, the subtleness of the um, learning differences and the behaviors you may not see until a child enters the schools 
until they get to school age. And again, and again, what we're seeing here is that no two children are affected are the same. And when we talk about the facial features and the physical features, we'll talk more about this. But this syndrome can also come and go as far as the physical features. But what does not alter is the brain damage. And that's the important thing when we're talking about behavior. And I guess we have another email question. Hello, I'm glad you're out there communicating with us. Question, when a baby is born to a mother who drank during pregnancy, do they go through withdrawals after birth? And if so, how soon after? Um, I think it will depend on how much alcohol she has had in the last probably 48 hours. Prior to the delivery. Yeah. yeah. And they do, I've heard, yes, they do go through withdrawal. Uh, I don't know. Do you know it's, more it's about not that? As, um, it's not as an obvious of a withdrawal as, say, to um, heroin or to cocaine or methamphetamines. Um, actually, what you may see is just a baby who's very, very lethargic, who doesn't suck very well, who doesn't eat a lot. Um, and, you know, people may attribute that to lots of different things, maybe not necessarily to the alcohol. And we do, you know, oftentimes do toxicology screens on both the moms and the babies, but alcohol is not something that is always tested for, and even when it is, oftentimes it does not show up in the baby's bloodstream um, for you know, a certain period of time after the delivery. But if you were going to see withdrawal, I would guess it would be within the first 48 hours after the delivery, and a lot of what it would look like would be um, lethargy and difficulties with feeding and, and um, mod modulation of their bodies within the nursery. And, you know, one of the things we've learned in clinic is that the hospitals are not always documenting, like, say, that the, uh, the uh, room smells like alcohol mm -hmm. at the birth of the child. So there's not always a lot of documentation that even tells us that alcohol was in the mix. Right. So. so I want to get back to Dad and uh, the fact that we do not have any human studies, obviously, as to what does happen when the sperm is affected. But in the laboratory, using rats and giving alcohol to dad rat and none to mom, what they have found is that many of the offspring are growth deficient and do si show signs of central nervous system damage because they can't follow through the maze to find the food and push the liver and all that sort of thing. So in the next slide, my message here is it takes a healthy man and a healthy woman to have a healthy baby. And someone looked at that and said, well, they don't look that healthy. And I say, hey, they're trying, right? <laughs> We're all out there. Trying and to that's get all we can do. That's is all try. we could do is is try that's to be right. healthy. But you know, it is important that dad support mom during the pregnancy. If we do have a drinking father, uh, it's really helpful if he can be sober with her. And another thing I want to touch on, uh, and I'll talk about it again later, is just how I have seen. I've not seen a mother who doesn't want a healthy baby that women do not drink to hurt their unborn children, but they drink because they have a disease, a disease of alcoholism, and that it really does take all of us to raise these children to help with healthy pregnancies and uh, help with children once they're here with us. And I think that what Carolyn said was a very, very <clears throat> important point, that even though we don't have research that specifically shows that a, um, an affected sperm may cause this or may cause that, what we do know from research and from um, you know other data is that dad plays an important supportive role in whether or not mom can maintain sobriety mm -hmm. during that pregnancy. And so just in that respect, he carries a great role in, what, in you know, whether or not this baby will be born healthy or not. Yeah, I was told a very powerful story last year about a woman who was alcoholic, uh, her partner also alcoholic, got pregnant, found out about fetal alcohol syndrome, really wanted to be sober and couldn't manage it. So she put herself into treatment, did very well in treatment, and came out obviously before the end of the nine months and found that when she went home, she wasn't coming home to a sober environment and her partner was not willing to be sober and within a few weeks she was out again drinking. So she called the treatment center and asked to come back and of course they didn't have space, said she'd already been there, etc., etc. And this woman took a bottle of whiskey, poured it on herself, took a toy gun and went to a nearby 7-Eleven and staged a holdup waiting for the police to arrest her because in King County when you, there's an alcohol related crime you can opt to go to treatment to the North End uh, Rehabilitation Facility or to jail. So when people say, you know, those mothers and I think as foster parents it's important for us to and understand that people are not out there trying to hurt their children. And I thought, you know, this woman has a felony on her record, and when questioned about it, she said, hey, it's worth it.
You know, my, my child has been alcohol free for most of the pregnancy. Uh, now I'd like to show some slides that will talk about the diagnostics of, alcohol, of uh, fetal alcohol syndrome and what we're looking for at clinic. In the first slide, we'll show the uh, characteristics that actually have been looked at since 1970 when they first started talking about this in the medical world. If I had my ways, I would kind of reverse this slide, and these slides belong to Dr. Susan Astley, who's the co-director at the diagnostic clinic, and she was nice enough to loan these to me. I would put in inner utero alcohol exposure at the top Top because it's very important to know, first of all, did mom drink during the pregnancy? There are many things that can contribute to the behaviors we see in our children, and that can be from environmental issues and other kinds of birth defects. So we do want to know if mom did drink during the pregnancy. So that has to be established either by the mother talking about it herself or someone that was close to her uh, that could report, yes, several times during the pregnancy, the mother was seen drinking X amount of alcohol. The second thing that we're looking for is growth deficiency, and I'm going to go through these in more detail in a minute. Uh, that's pretty easy to figure out at any time in your life. You can be weighed and measured and plotted against your age group. Then uh, the facial features, number three on the list, is also, uh, well, it's not that easy to diagnose. I think <laughs> Dr. Claren is, has taught many physicians how to do this, and that's always been the hardest part, is especially measuring the eyes. But Dr. Astley has developed a uh, program, a computer program, where we can put a non-smiling picture into the uh, computer and actually do diagnosis. And, and you will learn when we talk about the facial features why we don't want smiling pictures. The fourth thing on the list is the most difficult to talk about. And in clinic, when we do the diagnosis, it's usually about three hours. We always save the central nervous system dysfunction, the brain damage, until the last because it's the, the most difficult to tease out. And the clinic has changed quite a bit over the years in that we now do a lot of testing in clinic and there are uh, cl clinical psychologists, school psychologists, speech pathologists, occupational therapists. Julie Sayre is the family advocate. Of course, Dr. Claren is a dysmorphologist and a pediatrician. And so we have quite the crew there that is assisting with this diagnosis. It's truly a multidisciplinary team. Absolutely. And as you know, over tonight and next Tuesday, you'll, um, I think, realize that that multidisciplinary team is so important to our families and to our um, individuals who are affected with fetal alcohol syndrome and related conditions, and not just for a diagnostic purpose, but for interventions and for school and for all of those areas that a multidisciplinary team is yeah. of the utmost importance. And, and I encourage you, if you have a child in your home that's been diagnosed and, it's, and it was quite a while ago, I would consider re-diagnosis because the team has grown a lot, the diagnosis has changed a lot, and you'll get a lot of information, and also, of course, your child uh, is changing as well. And, you know, Dr. Clarence says now that there's no way he would diagnose by himself without the team, I'd at least have the psychologist with him to do the testing. Okay, let's first talk about growth deficiency then. And we've got a slide here. Actually, that, we've got uh, skills. Actually, this is, oh, I'm sorry. First, we're, this is the beginning of talking about how the diagnostics are done at clinic. And this is a four-digit Likert scale, it's called, that we look at where we're looking at growth and it's ranked from unlikely problems, possible, probable, definite, and then the face uh, and uh, the brain damage itself and how much alcohol mom drank. So these, when we look at this, we can figure out, and the next slide will show us, that we're going to have 256 possible combinations of those numbers. So when we say no two people with FAS are the same, you can really see that when you look at the, these diagnostic codes, that there are many combinations of growth, central nervous system damage, uh, facial features, and how much alcohol mom drank. So let's now talk about the growth uh, with a, a slide here and how we do the diagnosis in clinic. Can we have that slide? There you go. Oh, hmm. That wasn't quite the slide I expected. I'm sorry. So when you get, uh, that's all right. Go ahead and put that up again. Uh, when you get this uh, combination, these 256 possible combinations, they're put into categories. So you're seeing A through D, which is pretty much everything lumped under what we would call fetal alcohol syndrome. Uh, and uh, if you can get the other half of the slide, is that possible? No, okay. Anyway, everything below uh, the b below D, we've got E, I think, through G, and that's what we used to call fetal alcohol effects. 
And if you could see that uh, half of the of the uh, screen, you would see probably a little more than half. Again, that many uh, numbers listed there. At least there. half that. Yeah. Right. Okay. Now we're ready for growth now deficiencies. Now we're ready for growth deficiencies. So looking at the next slide, uh, we'll see, okay, this is how the growth deficiency is scored. So again, we're looking at two things, height and weight. Julie, do you want to talk a little bit about how tiny we have to be? Yeah, I will. Actually, um, when we think about most pediatricians or family doctors, um, will actually call a baby or a toddler or a child failure to thrive if they are within, if they're like in the 15th percentile for weight or less. And in our um, scoring system at the university, to um, qualify as a four, which would be our um, classic growth deficient child with fetal alcohol syndrome, we're talking about them being within the, or lower than the third percentile. So we're talking about very tiny, very tiny. And, um, you know, growth, usually that is about our easiest, you know, of the four to kind of tease out. Um, but we do at times, you know, if we have information about the birth mother and the birth father, like how much they weighed and what their size are or height is, but we need both. If we have both of those, we will actually adjust for parental height and for parental weight. Um, because sometimes we find we'll get a young man in who's 16 and maybe he's five foot five and weighs 135 pounds. Well, if we put him on a scale and, and looked at him with other 15, 16 year old boys, he would be in the low end of the average range. But if we know that say dad is six foot four and mom was five foot ten and you know they had um, good bone structure and were you know moderately um, well built that child would be de growth deficient at five foot five so we do try and adjust for parental height when we have that information um, and you know one of the reasons we say we would like to see kids before puberty is that sometimes puberty does uh, shoot them right up That's there right. and suddenly that growth deficiency isn't there anymore. This is a strange syndrome in that it actually <clears throat> the physical characteristics can come and go. But many times we see the kids losing the physical characteristics at puberty. Can I see the next slide please? Why are we worried about growth, uh, growth deficiency? Well things like failure to thrive obviously are serious in a child. They can even cause death, uh, hypoplasia, just uh, problems with muscle tone. And, and I think I've heard a lot of people talk about the fact that many children with fetal alcohol syndrome have that sort of floppy, right. floppiness about them. Uh, they t can tend to be very short and skinny in stature. Uh, Julie mentioned some of the things that you might see in newborns, especially the sucking and reflexes, because the muscles in the face are not developed correctly and a lot of times those connections are not made to the brain so that they don't really understand about the sucking. Do you want to talk about that it's a little bit? It's an oral motor actually, a, more, a motor planning issue and it's um, can it can be addressed by an occupational therapist who has some training in feeding therapy but the ability to be able to plan, you know, that you're um, sucking, swallowing, actually um, when to swallow, all those, that's a very complex task for, for infants. And I know that, um, you know, my son Brandon, when he was a tiny baby, there was many times that it could take us an hour to get an ounce of formula down him. And just even the trigger, you know, most babies, you place the nipple in their mouth, um, they automatically start to suck. And Brandon needed time to even be able to process that he could feel that that nipple was in his mouth and, you know, begin to, um, to suck and to swallow. And then the coordination is very hard for a lot of our children. Now, you might tell this story next week, but I think you should tell it now t as well about trying to get him to feed and recognizing uh, oh. overstimulation and so forth. Um, we're going to talk actually a lot about, you know, issues of overstimulation and all of that, but one of Brandon's hardest tasks as an infant actually was feeding. And a lot of it had to do with motor planning, like I was talking about, and just the muscle tone within his mouth, um, all of those kinds of things. But a lot of it also had to do with his inability to take in more than one um, type of stimulation at a time. So if we were going to like bottle feed Brandon, Brandon could not handle having eye contact being made with him at the same time that I was feeding him, or to be held 
and feed him. And so against everything that, you know, I was ever taught as a mom, you know, which was that you hold the babies, you cuddle them, you feed them, you know, you rock, um, establish, you know, eye contact, singing, all of those kinds of things. Those were not the things that we could do with Brandon. And there was quite a period of time in his life that we would actually have to lay him on the floor, um, swaddled either in a uh, receiving blanket or in his cradle board. And then I would have to move outside of his um, line of vision so that he was not actually able to see me and then just hold the bottle, you know, off to the side in his mouth and just kind of jiggle the nipple, you know, and he would take a few sucks and we'd jiggle the nipple again and he'd take a few sucks and that's why it could take us so long to be able to, you know, to feed him mm -hmm. and it was a difficult time in our family because he was the only, the only person he would feed for at that point too was me. And until I remember being at a training with Carolyn one night, and I said, you know, it's been an hour and a half, and Brandon never initiated the need for food either. He never cried because he was hungry. And so I said, yep, it's been an hour and a half. I need to get home. And I walked into the house, and it was so amazing because my daughter, uh, my middle daughter at that point, who was about 22, had Brandon, and they were um, actually sitting in the chair, and he was eating for her. And I walked into the room, and I realized that what she had done was she had gone and she'd put on my bathrobe and had stuffed the front of the bathrobe with a pillow because I'm a little bit more well-endowed than my daughter. And she was singing, you know, the little humming, the little ditties that I would hum to him, and she was holding him in the same arm, you know, that I held him in, and he was actually feeding for her. And he was almost a year old at that point, but it was a real breakthrough in our house, <laughs> believe me. And, you know, obviously Julie has smart children, but, you know, I think about women who also have fetal alcohol syndrome or, or related conditions themselves. Yeah. And, you know, how will they work with this child? How will they understand that they're not eating or will if they're not getting the signals from their children that they're hungry and understanding them, you can see how easy it would be for women to lose their children for neglect. I, you know, I, I agree with that totally. I mean, my doctors, my pediatricians knew me, and they trusted me. And when I said that I was feeding Brandon and, you know, trying to, and he even had a feeding tube for a year. And, you know, they trusted me, and they believed me that I said I was doing the bolus feedings, and right. I was hooking him up to the pump at night, and we were doing the oral feeds. So I was never questioned about the fact that Brandon was always below the third percentile, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. in weight. But I, I I know for a fact, I'm almost positive, that if Brandon's birth mom had had custody of him at that point, that there probably would have been, you know, some allegations or some phone calls of concern about neglect and, you know, not feeding him. So, And, I mean, even with a mother who is feeding the child, and they're still remaining at that really low birth weight, yeah. there could be a lot of questions. So these are things to think about. So the next slide is going to uh, show you two men, and I believe they're in their mid-20s. The uh, man on the left is pretty much the right height and weight for his uh, family and age and so forth, and the fellow on the right has the full-blown fetal alcohol syndrome. I don't know if it's just the picture or not, but his arms look like they are the length they should be for someone his age, uh, and the rest of his body didn't quite catch up. He has the facial features of fetal alcohol syndrome, and he also has quite a low IQ, which we will talk more about in the central nervous system part, but you do need to know that really not, even though this is the leading cause of mental retardation in the Western world, there are not that many people with fetal alcohol syndrome or related conditions who have IQs below 70. That's that right. the average IQ in the clinic that we've seen over the years of people with FAS is, I think, about 75. Right, 75. So do, do they qualify for SSI, things like that? No, and they and many times can you know, get through school marginally, uh, looked at as behavior problems, whatever. So this is really the hidden uh, disability. Yes. Fetal alcohol syndrome mm -hmm. is really a hidden disability, even when you do have the physical features. Uh, the next picture is a little girl, the same little girl, and you can see how tiny she is in that top left-hand picture. She's four months old, and you can see by her caretaker's hands how small she is. The next picture, she's four years old. The bottom left, she's eight years old, and the uh, right-hand uh, lower picture, she's 16. Now, she's doing very well. She's in her 30s now. These pictures are from Dr. Ann Streisku's study, and I do have permission to show these pictures in educational settings. And I say that because, you know, these are human beings with a 
with a birth defect. Uh, I, I should all ask you to, to do my oath. I swear I will never say FAS child. I will say child or adult with fetal alcohol syndrome. It takes a little more breath, a little more effort and concentration, but every one of us has a birth defect, and I certainly don't want to be identified solely by any of mine. And these children are much more than the fact that they have fetal alcohol syndrome. One last thing about growth. Um, just in oftentimes, if, if we think about when the largest amount of growth of, our, of the developing baby actually is, is in that last trimester right. of pregnancy. That's when, you know, as um, pregnant women, we really do start to show. And oftentimes with our um, drinking women, um, they will either enter treatment at that point in time, or we will see them actually really slowing down with their um, intake of alcohol. And so those babies actually may not be um, what we would call growth deficient in the respect of our criteria, you know, that below the third percentile, where, but we'll talk more about the other developing parts of the baby that are happening through the entire pregnancy. But that's the final yeah. little piece about yep. growth, I think. Absolutely. So now let's talk about the facial features, and we'll look at the uh, slide that shows how we score those uh, facial features. We're looking for three things only when we look at the face. We're looking for the lack of a filter, which is that little zipper under your nose. We are looking for uh, palpebral fissures that are short, and those are just, that's a fancy way of saying your eye slits, how wide your eye slits are, and how uh, thin the upper lip is. Yes, the next slide. Now, I have to admit that the, this slide and the next one are slides that are really not good anymore <laughs> because they have changed the way they diagnose the face substantially. But I show this to show you all the things that alcohol can do, whether we're using them for diagnostic features or not. Uh, if you look at that slide again, you'll see epicanthal folds. Uh, and who has epicanthal folds? Well, all Asian people have epicanthal folds. Flat mid-face is something we used to look for, and uh, that's too many times that might be a family trait. Microcephaly means small head, which means small brain. That does tip us off that there's some sort of brain damage, but it is not necessary for the diagnosis. A low nasal bridge, that's also something alcohol can do, but we're not always looking for that. The short nose, the small chin, and so forth. So again, we are just looking for those three features, the uh, lack of a philtrum, the short eye slits, and the uh, thin upper lip. If you look at the next slide, it is a little better description. Again, microcephaly is on there, but it is not necessary for the diagnosis. Again, it just gives us a clue that indeed there is brain damage. A small head means a small brain and that there's something organic going on. Uh, flat mid faces in this slide as well, and again, we're not looking for that. We are looking for uh, the philtrum being gone and the lip being thin and of the eyes slits being short. Now, one of the things that I remember when I first came to clinic, we used to look for all of these things, and they used to measure from the inside of the eye to the edge of the mouth because the measurement would be longer than in people who were not affected by alcohol. Why that is is that the bones in the face are elongated. They're, they grow down quickly, and uh, when you measured that, it would show that elongation. Also, from the nose to the lip would be longer for the same reason these bones here would grow down faster, elongate, and come out slightly, which also added to pulling that skin above the lip tight so that the filtrum, the little zipper under your nose, is gone. It also adds to the thinning of the lip. Now, something interesting about the facial features is that the lip is developed on the 19th day of pregnancy. So around the 19th, 19th, 19th to 20th. To the 23rd, and yeah. so if mom is not drinking, say mom's a binge drinker, which is a very unhealthy drinking pattern for the fetus, and mom does not manage to be drinking during that time, will her child have fetal alcohol syndrome? Are you thinking about that? What's think your answer? It. Think about it some more. Yeah, because and that's maybe that'll be their one of their uh, break homework yeah. assignments. I want you to think about that. If if they're uh, if she doesn't drink around that 19th day, will her child have fetal alcohol syndrome? Say she drinks heavy amounts of alcohol throughout the entire pregnancy, except right around that time. The other piece about um, the faith is. Um, 
when Carolyn had said earlier that alcohol can do anything, that is true. I mean, alcohol can affect any system um, developing within that baby. Um, but the system or the tissue that seems to be the most susceptible to alcohol exposure is brain tissue. And one of the reasons that the eyes seem to be smaller is because the eyeball is actually brain tissue. Right. And what causes our eyes or our orbits to open up as um, wide as they do is the largeness or the size of our eyeballs. So if our eyeball or the brain tissue is smaller, the opening, the palpebral fissure from here to here is going to be smaller. And I know I still hear my son's pe um, ophthalmologist who will say, oh, Brandon, yeah, he has fetal alcohol syndrome. Look how wide spaced his eyes are. And in reality, you know, if you looked at yourself in the mirror, um, usually we are about a third, a third, and a third. You know, it's an equal um, dimension here. And when our eyes are smaller, it gives that kind of perceptual appearance that we have a wider space between our eyes. And um, so people often call these children, say that they have wide spaced eyes. In reality, they have tiny eyes. Mm -hmm. And also this brings to mind a, a situation I'm always preaching about, do not diagnose. Do not take the information we give you tonight and go out and diagnose anybody. Of course, I know you're all going to go run and look in the mirror, so wait for 15 minutes when you have a break, and you're all looking at each other probably, <laughs> but you know, you cannot diagnose. It takes a team of people to do this diagnosis. And I remember hearing that Dr. Claren had gone up to the Arctic Circle to diagnose, I believe, in an Inuit village, and he found that they had a lot of epicanthal folds, not just a little, a little bit, but lots of extra skin all around the eye. And when he figured out a way to get in there and really measure that eye slit length, he found that everybody in the village had short eye slits. Did they have fetal alcohol syndrome to a person? Well, absolutely not. You know, the creator is very uh, creative, and there was a reason for all of that skin to protect you against glare and wind and all the things that are going on in the Arctic. So he had to change that because of their um, uh, ethnicity. Let's look now at some more slides. We have a slide here, actually, that is, a, is kind of real. I see it. Every time I see it, I think of Julie. I had this slide and not the, the three that follow at a training where I first met Julie, and afterwards she came up to me and was a little irritated and accused me of showing pictures of her newly adopted Brandon in public and that that wasn't uh, legal to do. And I was very confused by what she said because I had borrowed all of these photographs from a study that's quite old. I mean, many of these pictures are 20, 25 years old now. And she said, well, that newborn you showed, that was that was my Brandon. And I said, well... Uh, first of all, it's a girl, not a boy. It's a Caucasian girl, not an Indian boy. And this picture is about 20 years old. And so, you know, when we say people with FAS look more like each other than they do their family, it can even be more like each other than they look like um, uh, even their sex. And I remember walking into clinic one day, and again, I'm always preaching about don't diagnose, and seeing a young a teenage boy in the lobby and co going back to the diagnostic room. And this is at the CHDD at the University of Washington where they diagnose for many things, and we just have one room on Fridays there. And I came in the room and I said, oh, there's a boy out in the lobby with fetal alcohol syndrome. And Dr. Claren was quite uh, shocked that I would say that. And he said, oh, diagnosing in the hallway, are you? And he did indeed come to our clinic, and he did indeed have the alcohol syndrome. When they asked me why I said that, I said, well, my brain works slowly, and for a nanosecond when I looked at him, I saw a native boy that I had worked with at the Indian program who had been diagnosed with FAS. And then, of course, it dawned on me that this boy had a different skin color and a very different hair texture, but they looked so much alike. Their features were so similar that just for that instant, I really thought I was looking at this other fellow. So the next slide is that same little girl who is now, in this picture, four months old. Uh, she still has a great deal of space from the nose to the lip. You can see there is really no filter in there. Uh, that high, that nose, that pug nose high on the face, again, that's not part of our diagnostics anymore. But when we see things like that, and her ears, you can see, are uh, rotated slightly, I call that FAS noise. In the diagnostic 
uh, s session, we're just looking for that thin upper lip, no philtrum, and the short isolates. But when we see all these other features there, we know that alcohol was in the mix. And it, this picture is kind of deceiving because it looks in this picture like she has very large eyes, actually. Mm -hmm. um, but if you were to see her in person, you'd realize that she is very microcephalic. And so taking into consideration her small head circumference, her eyes, too, are very tiny. Right. And the next picture, she's eight years old. Cute. Now, this reminds me also, when we have people come to clinic, we ask them ahead of time to send pictures of their children. We do not want smiling pictures because every time any of us smile, our lip, our lip thins. The upper lip thins. It also pulls that philtrum a little tight. So we don't want to see smiling pictures. But she does still have all of the features of fetal alcohol syndrome. And in the next slide, she is 16. She still has uh, very short eyes, uh, slits. Her nasal bridge has popped up, though, and her cheekbones look a little fuller to me. Now, what do you see in that picture that's different? And as a foster parent or any parent, this is something to think about. She now needs braces. So I encourage people who take children with FAS into their home that they ask for more money for medical uh, bills and, and therapy, all kinds of things. Have you had any of your children needing braces or anything like that yet? We are, let's see, Theodore's had them, Ricky has them now, Michael and Tessa mm -hmm. are just beginning their sets, mm -hmm. and um, the only one actually out of the seven that may escape orthodontia will be Nicholas, and he's only six, so, you know, we have a ways to go yet before right. we figure that out. And, you know, this is, again, because of what happens to that bone structure in the face, that things aren't aren't uh, growing quite properly. And so a lot of our children end up needing jaw surgery. They get sinus infections because that sinus area, those cavities are not formed correctly. A lot of times they end up with uh, tubes in their ears, hearing aids, uh, needing glasses, uh, braces, for instance. Uh, some of the children have had as many as three sets of teeth mm -hmm. come in, uh, sometimes at the same time. So, you know, there are a lot of extra medical needs many times attached to the children who have the physical characteristics. Okay, in the next slide, it's an interesting situation because here's a young boy who was diagnosed with fetal alcohol syndrome at the age of eight. Now, what I usually talk about is the fact that when our children hit puberty, many times they grow out of all these physical features. So the next sh slide shows him at puberty, and actually, to me, he looks more like someone with fetal alcohol syndrome than he looked before that when he did get the diagnosis. Uh, his eyes are small and, and does have that wide set appearance. And I think his uh, nasal bridge is fairly flat and so forth. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> now, this girl was adopted when she was about three years old, I believe, and by the time she was five, the foster parents were ready to give her back. They were successfully raising three of their own children and uh, loved this girl dearly, and were certainly not going to give her back, but were very frustrated. And they represent pretty much all the families that come into our clinic, whether it's foster, adopt, or birth, in that they are very frustrated. They have gone through so much to get their children help and been told at many doors that the problem is them and not their child. That if they were a better parent, the child wouldn't have all the problems they have. And the, the foster mother of this child actually, who is a very confident person, after a year said she started to doubt herself, even though she had been doing an excellent job in raising her three boys. She started to wonder about her ability to parent this child, and she was very uh, volatile, and uh, one minute would be perfectly calm, and the next minute be shredding the furniture. So then they hired a lawyer because they got tired of being told that things were okay and there was no problem. And what they found in the next slide is something they did find in the records is this picture. Uh, and also with this found out that she was diagnosed with fetal alcohol syndrome before the adoption. And you can actually see all the features there. And at 19 now, she's still very tiny. And when I train social workers, many times they're fearful that if families learn about these uh, disabilities, that they won't want to adopt these children. I say, this is the best screening tool we can think of. We don't want any of our children in homes where they're not wanted. And there are plenty of crazy <laughs> angels like Julie and many of you out there, I'm sure, who love to have these children in their home and uh, make very good homes for our kids. So uh, we're going to keep talking about it. <laughs> okay, the next uh, slide. 
Now, I had a slide of her from a distance because I wanted to show you how really tiny, tiny she was. But also, this with her eye could be the result of the alcohol exposure. Again, alcohol can do anything to the brain and to the body. It can cause any kind of deformity, uh, even mental illness, uh, cerebral palsy. I think we've seen just about everything. So on the next slide, you'll see her at, at puberty and see that she really filled out quite a bit, and that's not uncommon at all. Oftentimes our girls, I think, seem to end up getting chunky almost right, at, at right, adolescence. So. Right. Uh, the next slide, uh, these are all examples of different things we're finding as we have been looking at people over time. And, of course, everything I say has an exception because what I'm going to say about this is if mom continues to drink and continues to have children, the children will become more and more affected. And then, gee, I think it was just last year we had a middle sibling right. where mom drank the same amount during all three pregnancy, and actually it was the middle sibling that was more affected than, than uh, the younger. But generally we find if mom keeps drinking and keeps having children, the children will become more and more affected. So the next slide is the slide you saw was a woman diagnosed with FAS, and the next slide is her younger brother. And you can see certainly that he has many more of the physical characteristics, and I believe that he also has more of the central nervous system damage as well. The next slide I kind of alluded to. Uh, uh, Oh, then this is also something else we're finding, that this is not genetic, that if you stop drinking alcohol during pregnancy, you will not have children with fetal alcohol syndrome, that this is not something that's passed on. And the mother of these two boys drank heavily during the pregnancy of the child on the left. She quit drinking and had a beautiful, healthy little boy on the right. My question, however, I must say, is if we are being exposed to alcohol as fetuses, to the point where our skeletal structure is affected, our brain is affected, could anything be happening to our DNA? I mean, is there possibly any kind of an effect uh, on our DNA? And also, as women, we have all the eggs we're ever going to have in utero. What is the quality of my egg? What are the quality? What what's the quality of my eggs? That's what I, I mean. Things like this, there's a lot of money that needs to be put into this arena to do a lot more research because there are many questions. Many questions. Do we have, is there any questions yeah, or do we answers? Have, anybody want to call us any? up, send us an email? The, the phone number, again, is 1-800-407-9487. If you have any questions, please feel free to call us. Okay, next slide then. We'll talk about the fact, again, that <clears throat> this is not hereditary. Uh, this woman is someone who has not been a drug user, has not been a drinker in her life. She has had many beautiful, as you can see, children, all very healthy, very normal children, but she's lost these children to the system. Why do you think that is? Now, there, there you go. You need to call us and <laughs> give us what are your ideas about that. That's right. Why do you think that she has lost her children to the system? Uh, well, I don't hear any phones ringing, so I guess I have to tell you. <laughs> she herself has fetal alcohol syndrome. Well, why would that mean that she uh, couldn't raise her children? Well, there are many reasons. People with fetal alcohol syndrome have areas that seem to be commonly uh, uh, damaged by alcohol. The, her ability to connect action and consequence is, is compromised. And when she goes off to the store to buy treats or toys or whatever for her children and doesn't come back for six or seven hours, she is surprised to find out that they have been taken away and, and she's lost them to neglect. They cry. She doesn't quite understand what that means. She'll take them and walk the floor with them possibly for hours. If you heard a crying child, you would probably do four things. And whether you can iterate them or not, I'm sure you would do them. You would check the diapers. You would make sure that they had been fed. You would make sure they weren't in pain and that they'd, been, that they'd had rest. But she doesn't know, she, these things don't occur to her. She doesn't get the, the uh, progression of things and maybe doesn't remember the lecture, the classes that she's gone to because her children have been taken away before. So she's gone to parenting classes. She did great in the class, but was because of memory deficit, she may not remember everything she was told. What then can happen? when a mother is carrying a crying child around for three and four hours, and it's a mother who possibly has also uh, had impulse control compromised. Well, 
not only neglect but possible abuse can happen. So, you know, a lot of these women who aren't even alcohol and drug users themselves are having a lot of trouble parenting their children, and many of those mothers end up with their children in our system. We have a phone call, I understand, from Port Angeles. Go ahead. I'm wondering here uh, why they always have a white mouth, or why does it always look like they have a white mouth? Um, hmm. I'm not sure. Why does it in a cross? Yes. Um, you know, I don't know that actually that it is necessarily, but I, I think that the children's faces end up sometimes looking disproportionate, especially if they're microcephalic. If their heads, if the circumference of their head is smaller, oftentimes um, all of the facial features that are, you know, that are on their faces actually look bigger. But if we were to compare them to another child of the same age, the, the feature itself is not any bigger. But I think that it's kind of a perceptual issue. Um, depending upon the size of or the head of the child. Mm -hmm. And again, uh, if we go to the next slide, we'll kind of end this hour with uh, more of your questions if you have them, but the uh, fact that no two children are affected the same. These are actually twins. And we, there are many, many studies of twins where one twin is affected, one not, one severely, one slightly, even in the case of identical twins. Alcohol can do anything. We don't know at what moment during the pregnancy, during which cell division, what drop of alcohol may affect what cell division. So it's really difficult to talk, except when we know things about the structure, the, the skeletal growth and, and so forth, the physical growth of the fetus. We do have some ideas what happens at what point during the pregnancy. But as far as the brain goes, we have really very little information on what is developing in month two compared to three, compared to four, compared to five. I know they do say at seven months you can play music to a uh, pregnant woman, and when the child is born, if you play five songs and that song's one of them, the, the fetus or the baby will respond to that one song. So things are happening at different levels in there, but there is absolutely no safe time to drink during the pregnancy. Uh, we do this in clinic all the time. We're not just old hippies, but it really means the first two months are critical. They are absolutely critical to the development of the fetus. And when do women know they're pregnant? Many women do not know they're pregnant the first two months. We're really wondering how much of it is out there. We feel that there uh, could be five times, six times as many people with related conditions as the syndrome where you're not able to really look at them and say, ah, this is why we have this kind of behavior, and we'll talk a lot about that. So we'll be happy to take calls. And, if and actually, maybe just quickly yeah. before we do go for a break, um, if we go back to that scenario that we had talked about earlier and thinking about you know, growth being um, determined specifically or especially during the last trimester of the pregnancy, that's when the baby's um, largest growth spurt in utero occurs. Um, we also know that the facial features actually are completely formed by about the 10th week of pregnancy. And then if we're talking about this complex set of anomalies you know, right in here that's formed between the 19th and the 23rd day of pregnancy, um, I just want to kind of give you all a scenario, and then during the next 10 minutes, you can think about this, and when, we're, when we come back for our break, you can call us with your answers if you um, <laughs> have figured this out. But in our scenario, let's take, for example, we have a young mom, or a young woman, rather, who has um, never touched a drop of alcohol in her life. And she gets pregnant, and somewhere around the 15th week of gestation, some catastrophic um, kind of occurrence happens within her life and she starts to drink and abuse alcohol on a serious level from the 15th week of pregnancy on. Now I want you to remember the four criteria for fetal alcohol syndrome. We need to have growth deficiency and remember when that occurs. We need to have a specific set of facial anomalies. Remember when those are, are formed. We need to have evidence of central nervous system damage and think about when the baby's brain is being um, is, is developing during that pregnancy. And we need to have evidence of and specific um, Report. Is reports of the mom's alcohol usage during pregnancy. So think about the scenario I gave you and think about whether or not that mom's baby, does she have a chance to give birth to a child with full-blown fetal alcohol? 
And with that, we will break for 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you.